Peter talked about the common platform we share. It's interesting that we share a common platform or perspective even with people who are atheists in the perception of biology. It's very commonly understood by biologists that living organisms look as though they were designed for a purpose. Um, Richard Dawkins here says that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And I think that this quote is apropos for our discussion today because we're going to be looking at complicated things, or rather the topic of biological complexity, and how best should we understand it and understand its origins. Of course, Dawkins represents the classical neo-Darwinian view that though things look as though they were designed for a purpose, that appearance of design is an illusion. And it's an illusion because, in his view, a purely unguided, undirected, mindless process of natural selection acting on random mutations has produced that appearance. Um, and so I want to open today by framing my remarks and the, in, in a sense, the discussion uh, relating this to the discussion that will follow. We want, we're going to be talking about the origin of com complexity. So here's a question. Do standard non-teleological, i.e. materialistic versions of evolutionary theory, such as those that Richard Dawkins represents, explain the origin of biological complexity or is there evidence that a purposive intelligence played a role? Now, Art and I may think differently about how to conceive of that, but I want to frame this in relation to the atheistic neo-Darwinists who have dominated the discussion and ask the question about complexity in these terms. Is it, uh, a non, does a non-teleological account of evolution explain the complexity we see, or does purposes of intelligence need to play some role? Now, when we're talking about biological complexity, we could be talking about a lot of different things. We could be talking about, for example, the distinctive arrangement of organs and tissues that constitute what biologists call animal body plans. And uh, I'm particularly interested in this right now. I've just written a book on the Cambrian explosion. And when we, we uh, have many examples of body plans, but the interesting thing about a body plan is that it's really an integrated structure involving many disparate parts that fit together into a functioning whole. Now we could also be talking about the individual parts or organs, the tissues, the different cell types that constitute an animal body plan, such as, for example, the compound eye that we find in insects or that have been found in fossilized trilobites from the very dawn of animal life. Um, or we could be talking at a different level about the genetic circuitry that's required for animal body plans to develop properly. This is a fascinating area of study in, in developmental biology, and the, uh, the slide on the screen actually shows a circuit that has been drawn to depict the way in which specific genes and signaling molecules interact with each other to form integrated circuits that control and direct cell differentiation and organization during the process of animal development from fertilized egg to adult animal. It's a fascinating area of study and another one that has revealed great complexity in life. Um, another area of complexity that we see in biology is a fascinating area, not about how cells are organized, but these are structures within cells called molecular machines, and there are many fascinating examples of these. I have slides showing two famous examples. The ATP synthase, which is an energy generating turbine that operates on a nanoscale in the, um, in the walls of mitochondria, and, pro and which produces the ATP molecules that store the information that drive all metabolic reactions inside the cell. These, these machines function on the same principle as a hydroelectric dam, but instead of the turbine being driven by a flow of water, they're driven by a flow of ions. And many of us are familiar with the bacterial flagellar motor, a rotary engine, again on a nano scale, with bushings, drive shafts, stator, universal joint, and a whip-like uh, propeller that drives the bacteria through liquid, chasing down its food detecting changes in sugar gradient, fascinating, high technology, low life. So um, fascinating types of complexity that we can talk about. But when we're talking about all forms of biological complexity, inevitably we must repair to the molecular level. 
Uh, in this bacterial flagella motor, for example, if you keep your eye on that universal joint, now watch me change the slide, you see that that universal joint is actually made of a, a precisely sequenced arrangement of amino acids forming a, a protein. The universal joint is a protein part, and many structural parts of, of um, molecular machines, most parts, are made of proteins. And proteins are, in fact, the most important functional molecules at a biochemical level because they do all the important jobs in the cell. They form structural parts of machines, they help process genetic information, and they catalyze important reactions inside the cell to keep us alive, and all cells alive. But if we go an even deeper level, we know that proteins are built, are synthesized on the basis of the instructions that are stored in the DNA molecule. And these instructions are the, a form of complexity, and it, is the, and it is this form of complexity that I want to address today. Because if we step back just a, a, a bit and realize that all the forms of complexity I've been talking about depend on proteins, and the proteins are constructed from the information in DNA, we realize the centrality of information, of genetic information, to understanding the complexity that we see in life. And we also realize that to explain the origin of complexity, we have to explain, at the very least, the origin of the genetic information that's stored in the DNA molecule. A quick aside, I don't want to imply that all the information that's involved in life is in DNA. We now have a whole new field of epigenetics, which is also a fascinating aspect of this discussion. But the genetic information is a necessary condition of all other forms of complexity. And for that reason, I want to focus my remarks on that today. So, um, a list of seven forms of complexity. I'm going to focus on the seventh item in the list. Now, the origin of genetic information is a question that intersects evolutionary biology in two contexts. There are two forms of evolutionary theory. There is the classical uh, biological evolutionary theory, which attempts to explain the origin of new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms. And then there is chemical evolutionary theory, which I've actually listed first on this list of two, which, ex which addresses the question of the origin of the first life from simpler pre-existing chemicals. It, as it happens, I've written books about the origin of information in both of these two contexts, but I want to address my remarks today in the interest of time to the first of the two, because in some sense it's the most fundamental question. How did the information necessary to produce life at all, life in the first place, arise? Now, when I was a college professor, I used to ask my students, uh, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And if I pause for a minute, you might call back to me, but I won't treat you like college freshmen. So, uh, uh, and obviously the answers would come, you know, code, information, uh, a program, etc. And they're all correct. And it turns out that the same thing is true in life. If we want to build a new animal from a pre-existing animal form, we need new information, and much of that information is genetic in form that needs to be provided by the evolutionary process. But if we want to build life in the first place from simply pre-existing chemicals, we also need information in part, or in very significant measure, to, to account for and to build those proteins that are necessary for life to arise. Now, I um, first encountered this question of the origin of information in the context of discussions about the origin of life. And at this point, I would like to step back a little from a formal presentation and just let you know that I plan to speak from this point forward a little bit autobiographically, and I do that for a couple of reasons. One, um, we're in a debate setting here, but um, I know that neither Art nor I are, uh, are here to score uh, debating points and trying to win an argument at the expense of the other. Uh, and I found out last night that he had structured his remarks in much the same way, uh, of explaining his own position. And that's what, that's what I want to do going forward, is explain a little bit autobiographically how I've come to the view that I, that I now hold. Um, uh, someone once asked me, how's a reasonably intelligent guy like you associated with such a disreputable idea as intelligent design? And uh, so what I want to do going forward is in a sense explain how I came to hold that disreputable idea. So I first encountered this question of the origin of information in, uh, 
uh, context of a discussion with a scientist named Charles Thatcher who had written a book called The Mystery of Life's Origin, which was about the origin of life problem. And he gave a very compelling chapter and verse critique of the various theories that had been uh, uh, put forward. And I found in talking to him and reading his book and getting fascinated with this topic, that the central problem in origin of life biology was this problem of the origin of information. And various different models had each come to a point of impasse because they were unable to give a satisfactory account of the information necessary to build life. I later then, after meeting this uh, professor in my mid-twenties, went to do a doctorate in England and in the history and philosophy of science, I ended up doing a dissertation on the question of the origin of life and the history and uh, scientific issues in origin of life biology. And so I became fascinated with this. I came out of a background in physics and geology. I was doing digital signal processing for an oil company, which was an early form of information technology. And the idea that information was central to this fundamental mystery at the intersection of science and philosophy absolutely captured my imagination. And so one of the first things I wanted to explore in my doctoral studies was exactly what, when we're talking about information inside life, what kind of information are we talking about? As a uh, quantitative scientist, I was aware of the definition of the information theory, the theory of Claude Shannon. But biology, it turns out, has a different kind of information than just the mathematical measures of, of improbability that are provided by Shannon's theory. Um, and so, and I started studying molecular biology to get to the bottom of this in my own mind. And what I discovered was uh, that after Watson and Crick made their famous discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule in 1953, Crick had a brilliant insight that he formula, formalized as a, a, as a conjecture or a hypothesis that was called the sequence hypothesis. And what he proposed was that the four chemicals down the spine of the DNA molecule, the interior of uh, uh, subunits of the DNA called nucleotide bases, that these nucleotide bases function like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in machine code. Uh, some MIT engineers very soon after said that the, the structure of the information in DNA was typographic. Now, that led to an understanding of the nature of the information as being not just uh, complex, but complex in a very particular way. That is to say, what Crick was saying is that what makes DNA special what allows it to function as an information carrier that has instructions for directing the synthesis of proteins is that those nucleotide bases are arranged in a very particular way. Just as in computer code or written language, the arrangement of the characters is crucial to the function that the sequence performs. The same is true in DNA. And so the DNA molecule does not just have complexity in the, in the brute sense of uh, of a, a series of characters that defy a, a simple ordered pattern. But the arrangement of characters in the DNA have a particular kind of complexity that we could call specified complexity, where the arrangement is crucial to the function. And this distinguishes the information in DNA, for those who are engineers and mathematicians, from the common uh, understanding of information provided by information theory, the information theory of Claude Shannon, where information is merely a measure of the improbability of a sequence of characters. The string on the top is highly improbable, but it conveys no, it has no function, it conveys no meaning. The string on the bottom, however, is highly improbable, and it conveys meaning and performs a biological function, or in this case, a, a linguistic function. And the, this was the first question I had to get settled in my mind. What kind of information do we have in DNA? We have functional information. We have specified complexity, not just brute complexity. And Crick himself, who was always at the forefront of these discoveries, made this clear in 1958, very much aware of the Shannon theory. He said, the information in DNA is not really Shannon information. He said, by information, he said, I mean the precise determination of sequence, either a basis in the nucleic acids or amino acid residues in the protein. So that was the first thing, and that, that's when we understand the kind of information that's in DNA, that explains statements like those by Richard Dawkins or Bill Gates, who say that the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Gates says the DNA is like a computer program, but more complex than anything we've ever, ever created. So that, led, that in a sense, defined what needed to be explained in origin of life research. And I was aware that there was an impasse in the field, but I wanted to know how deep that impasse was. Why was this, this information problem so difficult? 
And there were two problems that came to my attention as I got into the literature that explained to me why this was such a difficult problem. The first is called the problem of combinatorial inflation. And that's a mouthful, but I can explain that very simply with a picture of a bike lock. If you look at a bike lock, you realize that there are, and this one has four dials with ten digits in each. You might be tempted to think that that means there are 40 com possible combinations, but if you think a little more closely, we realize it's not 10 plus 10 plus 10 combinations, it's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 combinations, or 10,000. The number of combinations increases exponentially with the number of dials. So, no one sells locks like this, but I had our artists create one. If we have a, 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 a bike lock with 10 dials, we have 10 billion combinations, 10 to the 10th possibilities. Now both genes and protein, and I notice what's happening to the number of combinations as you increase each dial. They're in increasing or inflating exponentially, okay? So if you're a bike thief and you want to steal a lock, and you have a, and, and, or steal a bike, and you encounter one with a bike with a lock like this and one like this, you don't have to have, to, uh, to, have, to have a degree in math to decide which one to try, right? Um, and if you're, you're encountering one that has a 10 to the 10 possibilities, and you say, there's a security guard coming around the corner and only got 30 seconds. Is it more likely than not or less likely than not that you're going to sample enough combinations to have a reasonable chance of opening the lock by chance? It's obviously overwhelmingly less likely than not. Now, original life bio biologists came to the same conclusion about the chance hypothesis with respect to the origin of functional genes and proteins. And for much the same reason, because genes and proteins are also subject to this problem of combinatorial inflation. There are 20 protein-forming amino acids. If we have a, a, a string with 10, um, a short uh, peptide chain with 10, that represents, uh, there, are, uh, there are 20 to the 10 alternative possibilities uh, represented by that system. But if we go out a little longer and try to generate even a modest length protein, what we end up with is the sequence with a, a modest length protein of say 150 amino acids, our proteins are on average about 300 amino acids, we have 10 to the 195th possibilities, 20 to the 150th power. Now not every one of those, um, uh, uh, now there's, in the case of proteins, there's not just one combination that will perform a function, but even taking all the combinations that do perform functions into account, we still have a situation very much like the one our thief encounters with a 10 dial lock. There are so many combinations to sample in relation to the few that will open the lock that chance alone is not going to adequately sample that space of possibilities. And for, for reasons very much along this line, leading origin of life biologists from the 1960s onward have pretty much rejected, I mean, I, in fact, I would say categorically have completely rejected the chance hypothesis. Um, uh, Karen Smith here says that blind chance is very limited. It might be able to produce a few uh, functional sequences, very short sequences, but as the length of the necessary sequences increases, forget it. It ain't gonna happen because of this combinatorial problem. Now there's a second problem that's made this origin of information problem especially acute. And it's, it's the problem that information is not reducible to physics and chemistry. And this is, in a sense, a more profound problem. Um, now, <clears throat> this was first pointed out, and also pointed out about DNA, the information in DNA by the famous Hungarian uh, physical chemist, Michael Polanyi. And he noted that, he says, it's the arrangement in the printed page is extraneous to the chemistry of the printed page. In other words, information on a, in, on a book is not the product of chem the chemistry of ink binding the paper. He said, so is the base sequence in a DNA molecule extraneous to the chemical forces at work in a DNA molecule. Now, it took me a while to understand what Polanyi was getting on about, but as I learned more about the structure of the DNA molecule, one day his, the articles that he had written about this suddenly clicked. And if you look closely at the DNA molecule, you see what I, what I finally realized. Um, this is the structural formula for DNA. The sugar phosphate backbone is on the outside of the molecule. The nucleotide bases that store the information are on the inside of the molecule. And the little sticks represent chemical bonds. There was an idea in the 1960s that was proposed that suggested, well, if chance can't explain the origin of life, maybe some kind of natural law-like forces of attraction could. This was known as self-organizational scenarios, or the idea of uh, self-assembly because of forces of attraction producing information in DNA. 
The problem with that is that DNA does not actually have the kinds of forces of attraction at work that would enable us to explain this information as a result of chemical interactions between its constituent parts. Notice between A, C's, G's, and T's that there are no bonds connecting them. Notice also that there's the same kind of bond between the backbone and each one of the bases. It's called an N-glycosidic bond, and it has an amazing property in that it allows any one of those four bases to attach to the DNA at any site, which means that there's no chemical reason as to why one base is one place rather than another, which is to say that the information in the DNA, which is the precise sequence of arrangement, is not determined by the chemistry of attraction. Now, the quick visual illustration that gets this across, uh, have you ever seen these little magnetic letters that you can put on a refrigerator or a chalkboard, a magnetic chalkboard? Um, I had my wife take a picture of it when I left my visual aid at home. So she took a picture and emailed it. This is uh, I'm pandering to the local audience here. But um, here's, a, here's a, a, uh, an information-rich sequence. And there are indeed forces of attraction that explain why the sequence sticks to the medium, the, the backboard here, the chemical backboard, or the physical backboard. But notice that those magnetic forces are not responsible for the sequence that constitutes the information in this little message. And we can prove that the, the magnetic forces are not responsible because we can rearrange the letters to destroy the message or create a new one. Now the same thing turns out to be true in DNA. The forces of attraction are not responsible for the information in DNA. So as we think about the tools uh, available to the scientists to explain the origin of information, chance and necessity, or the combination of the two, as I thought about it, and as I got deep into the literature, I found that, that there was a reason, some fundamental reasons, why all these origin of life theories were failing. And so I began to think about whether or not it was possible that another approach could be taken. The idea that perhaps the information in DNA was the product of an intelligence of a mind. Intuitively, there's an obvious connection. Bill Gates says that the software program is like DNA. We know that software programs come from programmers, not from wind and erosion or random number generators. So I began to wonder if this intuitive connection between mind and intelligence couldn't be cashed out as a formal scientific theory. And that led me to, to study the works of, oddly enough, Charles Darwin. Because not only was Darwin a great evolutionary biologist, he was a pioneer in the application of a method of, of, of historical scientific investigation that allows scientists to investigate events in the remote past. And this method of investigation is sometimes called the method of multiple competing hypotheses or the method of inference to the best explanation. And Darwin used it and defended this method as being a properly scientific approach to the kind of topic that he addressed. It did raise, however, a question, which was, what does it mean to be the best explanation? One of the uh, lecturers at Cambridge when I was there as a PhD student wrote a whole book on this, Peter Lipton, a book called Inference to the Best Explanation. And it turns out that there are important criteria for determining what the best explanation looks like in science. And many of the 19th century pioneers of historical science had already worked this out. One was Charles Lyell, who said that when we were looking at these events in the remote past, we should try to explain them by reference to causes now in operation. And when I heard that, or when I read that, a nickel dropped for me, because I realized that that was the methodological key to the whole subject. This, is the, this was the idea behind his dictum that the present is the key to the past, that when we're trying to explain events in the remote past, we should do so by reference to causes that we see operating in the present that are capable of producing the effect in question. And so I asked myself a question. What is the cause that produces functional digital information? What is the cause in our present experience of which we know that can do this? And then it hit me. Of course, it's intelligence, it's mind. And then reading a little bit later, a, a pioneer in the application of information sciences to molecular biology, I came across this provocative passage. Henry Kossler here said, the creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Is that true? Well, our ordinary experience bears witness to exactly that. Whether we're looking at a hieroglyphic inscription or a newspaper headline or information embedded in a radio signal, or a computer program, whenever we see information and we trace it back to its source, invariably we come to a mind, not a material process. 
And so I came to the conclusion that, you, that it was possible, using the very method that Charles Darwin had pioneered, to develop a scientific case for intelligent design. In fact, I uh, unpacked that case very self-consciously using this method of inference to the best explanation. It, looking at uh, explanations for the origin of information based on chance, necessity, the combination of the two, and finally concluding that only intelligent design had the causal powers, the known uh, capacity to produce information. And therefore, when we found information in a living cell and wanted to best explain it by reference to causes now in operation, intelligent design was in fact the best explanation. This is not an argument from ignorance, it's an argument from what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. Last point is that the main reason that people have offered for rejecting the design hypothesis that I've proposed to explain the origin of information necessary to produce the first life is not scientific. A very prominent biologist wrote me after I published Signature in the Cell and said, you know, I agree with you about all the science. He said, in fact, you, know, you have a chapter on the RNA world, which is supposedly the, the cutting-edge idea. He said, it's, it's a mess. It presupposes all, all, all kinds of pre-existing genetic informa or information. Um, but he said, I am committed to a naturalistic solution to the problem. And many scientists believe that we must explain things by reference to purely material causes. And that's a principle known as methodological naturalism, methodological materialism. So for them, the cognitive landscape looks a little different. Rather than trying to infer to the best explanation, they insist that we must infer the best materialistic explanation. I'm committed to, to, having, to, to a science that seeks the truth no holds hard, where we follow the evidence wherever it leads. And so I think methodological naturalism restricts the intellectual freedom of scientists, therefore it's anti-intellectual, I think it's like really against the spirit of the scientific enterprise, and I think instead we should look for the best explanation regardless of whether it leads to an intelligent cause or a purely material one. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much.